won't get the whole class. Yeah. So we're not going to get the whole class recorded because I forgot to put it on the first 30 some slides. So when you're doing um, positive pressure ventilation, um, you're going to lift the jaw to the mask as you tilt the patient's head backwards. I'll lift in the jaw, squeeze the mask with the thumbs to achieve a seal, give breaths to the one way valve. Um, it's a little picture of it. You can see where they've got the oxygen hooked into the into the mask on this one. Again, our most of the masks we carry on our ambulance do not have the oxygen port. Um, not the mask. Okay, basically the same thing. You're just not using a bag valve mask at this point. Um, yeah, I'm going to go through this stuff pretty quick because basically going over the same things. Again, if you have to give mouth to mouth, don't. I mean, do if it's life-saving, but if you got other options, use the other options. Um, in this case, you're going to head, use a head tilt chin lift me method, put them in a sniffing position, um, apply a, a barrier. Oh, this mouth mask. Just repeat. Oh, this is spinal, without a spinal injury. This is with spine injury. Okay, my bad. So put in a uh, sniffing position best you can. Um, again, thumbs on the side of the mask or of the thumbs along on the sides of the hand along the mask to hold it to the face shield. So it's going to be a little bit different. Instead of wrapping your thumbs around it, you're actually going to put your thumbs on either side of the mask and push down using that. You're going to use all four fingers to create a jaw thrust. Lift the angle of the jaw, tilt the head, and then um, squeeze the mask with your thumbs and fingers to seal it. And give a breath through the one-way valve. So you see the chest rise. Okay, the reason we like using bag valve masks is they provide uh, infectious barrier. Uh, you're not going to get that anything he pukes up into your mouth you're not blowing COVID into him he's not blowing COVID into you they come in infant child and adult sizes um, you can get these pretty cheap on Amazon because everything's cheap on Amazon um, if you want a smaller one you can spend a whole lot of money or if you know a medic in the military you can get a North American Rescue it comes in the size of about a three to four inch canister that's about two to three inches high. Um, and it has everything in it, but those are expensive. Those are about $60 a piece. You can get a full set of bag valve masks off Amazon for about $25. So, um, they consist of a refill shell, um, non-jam valve, it allows oxygen inlet of 15 liters per minute. Um, once we get into doing the practicals, we'll go over all that stuff a little more in detail. These are three sizes. Uh, mechanical workings, oxygen is attached and enters through the reservoir. Uh, when squeezed, their inlet closes, the oxygen is diverted to the patient. When released, patient passively expires, and as the patient exhales, the oxygen enters into the reservoir. To rescue your BVM non-trauma suspected, you're going to use a double C grip. Uh, the patient, uh, the person kneeling at the patient head is going to use the mask. Uh, the other person is going to be at their side. Again, um, Apex of the mask is over the bridge of the nose, so the point of the mask is going to be over the bridge of the nose. Lower part is going to be resting just below the mouth on the chin. 
index and middle ring fingers, uh, bring the jaw to the mask, and second rescuer squeezes. A spinal injury. Again, you're going to keep the and correct, uh, select the correct size of BVM. You're going to use that same thing with thumbs alongside the mass to hold it down. You're going to use your index middle ring finger to do a jaw thrust, basically, and lift that chin to the mask and try and do it without tilting the head. And the second rescuer squeeze the bag just like you would for a non spinal injury. This is a good picture of it. All right. So one rescuer, BVM ventilation. We just went over most of that. Yeah, we'll go over a lot of this stuff once we start actually doing it. And again, if it doesn't, if you don't see chest rise and fall, reposition the head, check for blockage if you don't get a breath in on the second one. So every time you squeeze the bag, ventilation is pushed into the lungs. Prefer to use these if you got uh, supplemental oxygen. Um, if you can, either with the pocket mask or the BVM, you want to have oxygen hooked up to it. A lot of times you'll see us, uh, if your uh, fire department guys have seen us, when we first get in, we start working on cardiac arrest, we'll use the BVM without oxygen until we can get it hooked up to oxygen. Um, you're still breathing in atmospheric air, which is 21% oxygen, um, and the rest nitrogen. So when you're doing a stoma, so a stoma is a hole in, in the throat. These are people who have airway issues or issues where they can't breathe in normally. Um, mm -hmm. Most common uh, blockage of this is a mucus plug. You can usually suction this out with a suction catheter. Um, sometimes they're a little larger. You can't quite get them out, but you can at least get them displaced enough with a suction catheter to be able to ventilate them. You can use a pediatric size mask over the top of the opening to the stoma if, uh, um, if they normally have a, a tracheal tube in there and it's been dislodged. You can use a mask over the top of it. If that trachea tube is still in there, then you can just attach the, the BVM straight to it and breathe through them that way. Then ventilate appropriate for the age of the patient. So if you're ventilating too slow, you can hypoventilate these patients and cause hypoxia. If you breathe too fast, you can cause hyperventilation, which blows off CO2. The other issue is if you breathe too hard for them, you can pop a lung pop one of the alveoli in the lung. This happens in children quite a bit where people are getting too aggressive. People freak out when they're dealing with children. If you're a little too aggressive with it, you can actually pop along with it. So you want to be careful with it. Nice, easy breath. Once you see that chest rise and fall, stop. Once you see that chest rise, that's good enough. Adults, you want to ventilate 10 to 12 times a minute. Children, going to be uh, 12 to 20 times a minute. So again, your ventilation rate is going to be right about um, two, one breath every two to three seconds usually. Um, and uh, your school age children or your preschool children, you can uh, raise that up to about every three to five seconds. You said the children is two to three seconds? Like younger children, yeah. 
Right. Um, also, you're worried about gastric extension. So the harder you push, the more likely you're pushing air into the abdomen rather than into the lungs. Because all that extra force, some of it's going into the lungs, whatever's left is going to go down into the abdomen. So you want to be careful with gastric uh, distension. And again, too much volume can cause lung tissue trauma. Should be slow and gentle, two to three fingers on that. So um, when I bag somebody, I actually bag two fingers and a thumb. I'll have the third finger resting there, but it really doesn't do a lot. And it's not a full compression of the thing. You don't have to be forceful with it. It's just nice, easy, slow ventilations. Uh, ventilation should take be delivered over a period of about one second. So when I count, it's 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, 1,000, 4, 1,000, 5, 1,000, breathe. And as I breathe, I'm squeezing in on that bag. And then usually by the time I'm done with breathe, the air's in, I let it go. All right. So automatic transport ventilators, we do carry those on the trucks. They have settings and rates and volumes and all that stuff. Um, we will bring one of those up uh, next class. Um, after the test, we'll go over them a little bit. Uh, maybe beneficial for prolonged ventilation. Your hands will get tired of ventilating people. That's why when we're doing CPR or something like that, we're switching out every two minutes. Um, usually we like to have, if we can, three people on the back of the truck that are helping us just with the airway and, and CPR. So we'll just rotate through those two, those three people. And that's their job. Uh, the rest of us in the back are doing IVs, um, everything else that we have to do in the back. All right, this is what a transport ventilator looks like. Ours is a little bigger than this one, but it works on the same function. It has uh, breaths per minute. The white is for adult, the orange is for children. It's got a setting for adult to child, and then your tidal volumes here. And ours exactly the same as that one, just a little bigger. So oxygen therapy. Oxygen is imported is an important beneficial treatment. It is considered a drug. So it's one of the drugs that you as an EMT are allowed to use. You can use it without doctor or without voice order. It is a standing order on most ambulance services. But it can, too much oxygen can be uh, detrimental in patients with heart attack and strokes. With those people, we want to keep a saturation of right around 94 to 95%. We're not giving them too much. What they found is too much oxygen is when that oxygen actually is allowed into the heart or they start getting a return of spontaneous circulation is that sudden flow of oxygen in there actually damages the cells. Because all of a sudden they have no oxygen, all of a sudden they're getting hammered with oxygen and it actually causes the cells to rupture or to be damaged. So used to be everything in, as an EMT was 15 liters non-rebreather mass. Now it's titrate to 94 to 95% oxygen. And then down here it says always ventilate cardiac arrest patients. So if they're in cardiac arrest, ventilate them. They do teach uh, hands-only CPR to the layperson now because they found that in most areas, EMS will be on scene within 10 to 15 minutes. There's still enough oxygen within the airway, 
in that dead space, that doing CPR, keeping that circulating is enough to keep that patient going for a while. Plus, every time you push down on the chest and release it, what are you doing to that chest cavity? You're collapsing it and letting it go. It causes what kind of pressure in the chest cavity? No? Negative pressure, right? So every time you push and let up, it's causing negative pressure within that chest cavity. So what's it doing? It's drawing atmospheric air into the lungs. So actually doing hands-only CPR, they found uh, increases survival rates quite a bit, like about three to four percent, which is when you consider chances with CPR and defibrillating is only a 15% chance of survival. If that CPR is started immediately, a hands-only CPR, you know, now you're increased to 16 to 17% survival rate. So that increases that exponentially better than what they had before. That's also why you're seeing more AEDs out there in the world, in stores, in gyms, and schools, is because quick Defibrillation also saves lives. All right. So, so it must be safe, lightweight, portable. We carry three different or two different sizes of oxygen tanks on our trucks. We have what's called a D cylinder, which, if you look at the picture on page, what page are you on? I am on 265. 265, that small one in the right-hand corner, that is a D cylinder. That's the size we carry on our trucks. Um, the thing above it is called a regulator. Our regulators are attached to our oxygen things. They are, they're just permanent. Well, So the ones we currently have on our trucks look like this. You can see the regulator is attached onto the, it's part of the bottle. For those out there, this is what it looks like. Hope we can see it. Yeah, nope, our screen's frozen, so they'll get plenty of time to see it when they get in. So it's permanently attached. You don't have to worry about um, the old style of blowing out the air before you put the regulator on. We'll still still show you that type in case you ever run across them, but um, yeah, it's a little bit different now. Uh, the other system we carry, the other tank we carry is a K tank, I believe, or an M tank. And it's, uh, I believe it's 3000, an old 3000 PSI or whatever it is. Um, Yeah, K tank holds 3.14 liter. Anyhow, it holds a lot. It's a lot bigger than this one is. Um, they all hold a pressure of 2,000 psi in the tank. Is a full tank, so uh, it's a little different than our SCBAs. Our SCBAs that we use on the fire department hold 4,200. PSI. So as far as the pressure of the tank, the tank will hold. Those uh, cylinders contain about 3,000 liters of oxygen. Yeah. Yeah, so that's liters of oxygen. So yeah. So an M and a K are about the same size. We also do have one truck that has a G tank, I believe, on it. It's a little smaller tank. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I know them by, hey, it's a big tank. It's what we need for this truck, or it's a little tank. So um, this is the only one I know for sure what the name of it is because we use these all the time. Um, now the devices like BVM pocket mask can be used to force oxygen into the patient's lungs. So again, get your ventilator and your mask to help push that air into the lungs. So here's the sizes. 
So an M tank's about 3,000. Your G tanks are really big. Um, the hospital runs off an H tank, which holds about 6,900 uh, liters of oxygen. Uh, that actually, I think theirs might actually be a little bigger than that because it's an in ground storage and it runs the entire hospital. And so, um, and I think we covered this a little bit last week the green and the white are what your oxygen tanks look like. So, if it's got green on it, it's medical grade oxygen. The other color you'll see is for nitrous oxide and it is yellow. This is a nice one that has a little oxygen um, removal system in it. It's a jack that takes the oxygen tank out of the ambulance. We have that on one of our trucks here in Douglas and another one in Glen Rock. Other, other than that, all the other ones you have to actually lift up into there. We have a little jack thing that we can jack up and push into there. It's kind of cool. Back in the day, we used to have to manually lift them up into there. So, a lot of injured backs. All right. Cylinder safety always use pressure gauge regulators to be intended for that uh, piece of equipment. Um, never use a non ferrous wrench. Anybody know why? Static electricity. So oxygen feeds flame. And so it can be pretty, uh, pretty flammable. That's why we discourage people from smoking with oxygen on. Um, sure, the valve inserts and gaskets are in good condition. Always use medical grade. Always open the valve fully, then close it half a turn to prevent someone from forcing, trying to force the valve. So if you're riding me, with me in a truck, when I open up the tanks in the back, I know which directions. I'm comfortable with knowing which direction goes on and off. So I will crack it about two turns. But if you're not familiar with it, you haven't been around enough, open that sucker all the way open and then just give it a half turn back. And what that'll do is when you, if you know it's all the way open, if you turn it the wrong way and you feel resistant, you're not going to try and force it. You know, okay, I'm, I'm back to where it's fully open. Now I have to spin it the other way to get it closed. I would store them in a cool environment, ventilated environment. Um, hydrostatically tested. We get all ours from air gas, so we don't reuse the same cylinders all the time. We don't refill them. There are ways of refilling them, but we don't, we don't do that. Um, never drop a cylinder or let it fall against any objects. Never leave oxygen cylinder staying upright without it being secure. So all our big tanks in the, over next door have a chain that go around them to keep them from falling over. All our small tanks, like the D-size tank, are in a cart that keeps them from falling over. Uh, the nice thing about these, uh, the Ds with the handles on them, is uh, we were bringing a patient in this last summer, doing CPR on them, and it caught the door as we were coming in and got thrown out of. It wasn't secured enough on the ambulance stretcher, got tossed out, landed upside down just like that. So this, the handle on it protects it. The old fashioned ones, it probably would have broken the head off and sent it up to the second floor. So there is a lot of pressure in these and they can go through walls if you let them. So if it falls, get away from it and just let it fall. Um, yeah, never smoke around it. It is a flammable oxygen. The firefighter triad is fuel, oxygen, and heat. So if you have heat and fuel going, you don't want oxygen to be around it. It's going to increase that burn.
Never used around open flame. Um, never used grease oil. <sighs> Fat-based lubricants or fat-based soaps, devices that will be attached to the cylinder. Never use adhesive tape. Why don't you think you want to use adhesive tape? What's the adhesive usually? So duct tape is a flammable. It's usually some kind of glue and it is flammable also. Um, one of our medics decided to fix one of our leaks in our tank by wrapping duct tape around it. Luckily we caught it before it did any damage, but yeah, it's, it can, that oxygen flowing by that creating um, static can be your heat source. And that static igniting that glue with that high oxygen thing can cause a flame. So, you know, we don't like that. So, never try to move an oxygen cylinder by dragging it or rolling it on a side or bottom. So, anybody in here weld? How do you move your acetylene tanks? All right. That's how you move an oxygen tank. But you usually leave the little cover on the top of it. So that if it does fall, it's not going to break that valve off. Uh, pictures again. Okay, a pressure regulator must be connected to the cylinder. Again, ours are already attached to it. Um, this usually comes with your E size or lower. Before connecting the regulator, you want to open the main valve and blow out the port where you're going to be hooking that into. Make sure it's free of debris or dirt or anything like that. So flow meters are attached to a wall. Um, they're also attached to these regulators on the small tanks. It's usually a twisting valve. Um, Regulator. Uh, these are marked on top with a 25. That's how many PSI you can get out of these. Um, 25 is usually only used for CPAP and um, ventilators. You also have a port on the side of it that you can hook in a ventilator or a CPAP machine to, and that will bring out 25 PSI automatically. Don't have to worry about adjusting the valve on top. So that's a direct port into the oxygen. You hook your um, ventilator or your, or your CPAP machine up to that, and it's just providing oxygen. In doing that, you will burn through this tank in about 20 minutes or less. Uh, we've actually hooked up a full tank to a patient who was on the second floor of a um, duplex, and by the time we got him down to the bottom of the steps, the tank was empty. So you want to make sure you have multiple tanks available and you want to be careful with them. Our ventilator that we use uses oxygen a little more efficiently. One of these small tanks will last probably about 30 minutes with them. Um, big tank will last, depending on how full it is, a couple hours. We can vent a patient from here to Denver, but once we get back, we're going to have to change that tank. So high pressure flow me uh, meters should never be used on oxygen powered devices, respirators, or ventilators, or may be necessary, excuse me, may be necessary. So again, that's what that little um, screw valve on the side is for, is for high pressure. And again, this one here will do up to 25. We're using the CPAP that we currently use. We hook it in, put it at uh, 25 um, pounds per second, pounds per square inch. And that will allow um, the CPAP to effectively work. Just some examples of flow meters. This uh, regulator that goes on the on an E or a D tank. Um, this is a wall-mounted one that you'll see in ambulances. We don't carry this particular brand, but 
they're similar to it. This is your high pressure port on the side of the regulator. <coughs> so sometimes humidified oxygen may be necessary. You can hook up it through the, usually we use these on the, <coughs> on the ambulance ones. We'll screw them into the port on the bottom where the Christmas tree normally is. And then hook our oxygen into it. And that'll give humidified oxygen into a patient. This may be necessary with infants and uh, uh, elderly people that have issues with their lungs. It helps keep the lungs moist. And so they don't dry out and start having problems with the alveolar, uh, alveolar like collapsing and ceiling. And again, we don't use them very often in an emergency setting. We do every once in a while, we'll use them in uh, long transports. And this is how you hook it up, screws onto the regulator and then you adjust uh, how much oxygen they're on that runs through it. Yeah, tongue, if tank gets punctured or the valve breaks off and become a missile, oxygen can cause fire to burn more rapidly. And under pressure with, and oil creates a severe explosive reaction. So that's what I was talking about. Duct tape has that kind of oil based adhesive on it. Oil and oxygen creates booms. So you want to avoid using any kind of duct tape. Now we do carry medical duct tape on the ambulances in our head blocks. That is not an oil-based adhesive. So that stuff's safe to use in and around oxygen. So again, an oxygen toxicity, you get too much oxygen in there. Our air sac collapse occurs during the overload. Um, eye damage with premature infants. If you've got oxygen flowing at too high of a rate, it can actually cause damage to the eyes. Um, respiratory depression or respiratory arrest. When the hypoxic drive is diminished in a COPD patient, this is not something that we worry about in um, the EMS field unless we're going to have them on oxygen for a long period of time. Usually how long we have them on, it's not going to uh, deplete that hypoxic drive enough that they go into a respiratory failure, respiratory arrest. And then underlying conditions such as myocardial infarction or stroke can be exasperated with too much oxygen. Are you going to get into uh, knowing how much oxygen is in this year? Yes. We'll get into that more once we get into actually playing with it. And it might go in, I think it goes into it a little bit here. So mild distress um, can be administered through nasal cannula. Again, what we're looking for is titrating. This probably will answer your question. Um, what we're looking for is titrating their SpO2 level up to about 94 to 95%. We just wanna get them up to where they're doing okay. We don't want to overload them. So yeah, um, you'll notice a lot of times for the fire guys, when you get on scene, we'll put them on nasal cannula first to try and get them up to that. A lot of it depends on what their SpO2 is when we get there. The lower the SpO2, the higher the, or more aggressive we're going to be with it. If they're in the low 80s, high 70s, you're probably going to see a nasal, uh, a non-rebreather go on them. If it's in the high 80s, mid to high 80s, we're going to use a nasal cannula to try and get them up to that above 90%. And then we're going to try and titrate them from there up to that 95, 94%. When you guys, like say, when you're in the high 80s, mid 80s, do you have like a number in mind you set them to that like five in mind? Or is that kind of just always kind of like something? So it depends on the patient. You know, what's what's their work of breathing? Why are they at 94 or 80% instead of the 90s is going to be a big thing. 
a lot of times I start them out low. I'll start them on two liters and see where they go to. And if I can get them into the low to mid 90s, I'm happy with it. I'll start worrying about getting them up to that 95% once I start looking into what else is going on with them. Other people, you will see them go straight to six liters, try and get them up to that 95% right away, and then titrate them down. But it just depends on who you're working with. Uh, moderate, um, you can use either a, um, so moderate to severe, you're looking at non-rebreather. Um, pretty much that's all we carry on trucks. We do carry the simple masks on, on the trucks, but a lot of times we use those for doing aerosol um, nebulizer treatments. Um, when the person can't hold it or we want to be checking their arms out and stuff like that. So we don't want them holding the piece pipe for the breathing treatments. We'll put a mask on them and run the breathing treatment through the mask. And then local protocols, again, every ambulance service is going to have different protocols on how you use it. Ours are pretty lenient and rely a lot on our discretion. And so it's kind of nice that way. Our doctors here trust us enough to say, you guys know what you're doing, titrate how you feel necessary. So, so non-rebreather is the best way to deliver oxygen. You're looking at about 80 to 90% oxygen delivery through a non-rebreather at 15 liters per minute. Um, a lot of times with this, it used to be 15 liters was the way to go. You said back when I went through, it was non-rebreather 15 liters. Every patient. Yeah. Yeah. That's not so much the case. Now, if you're going to be putting a non-rebreather on them, start at 10 and titrate up. Um, it's better to start low and titrate to where you need to be than to get too aggressive and mess them up. Uh, nasal cannula, I believe, is 20 to 60% at 6 liters or 20 to 44%. I think it's 20 to 60%. And then your simple mask is 44 to 60. And then they have what's called a venturi mask, which is a mask that's got holes in the side of it. And what we use the venturi for is people get claustrophobic with a mask over them. A lot of times we can put that venturi over them, give them a little more oxygen, and it cuts out the claustrophobic feeling of having a mask over your face. All right, what does that say? Okay, so the ones we carry on the truck are actually called a partial non-rebreather because a true non-rebreather will have flaps on it so that when you breathe in, the oxygen you're getting is 100% oxygen. When you breathe out, it allows the gases, the CO2 to escape, where ours don't have the flap on it. And so it always allows some oxygen to escape. So with our, non, our partial non-rebreathers, you're looking at about 80% oxygen delivery. Pretty sure there's supposed to be a picture there and there. All right. So nasal cannula, 24 to 44%. I'm sorry, I said 60%. So yeah, 20 to 4 to 44% oxygen delivery. Um, two prongs in the nose. You want to make sure those are down. So uh, nasal cannula has a arc to the prongs. Those prongs, the arc should go down, not up. Now, what happens if you put them up is they'll sometimes, as their patient's moving, that'll actually go against the top of the, the nares and close off the airway or close off the oxygen. Maximum delivery is on these is four to six liters per minute. With a non rebreather, the minimum is 10 liters per minute.
These are good for patients that refuse to wear a facial oxygen mask. They do have in the hospital, they have high flow ones that will go up to eight liters per minute. We don't carry those on the truck. Those are usually signified by a green color to the tubing, similar to this, where it's uh, just a green tubing. It's a little bit thicker wall on the tubing, allows for a little higher oxygen rate going through it. More pictures there, aren't there? Partial rebreather. Um, that's again, uh, these are also called a, oh, these are what I think what we have partial non rebreather. So again, 40 to 60%. Now these are, uh, I'm not sure what these ones are. Maybe this is what we carry is partial rebreather. So, anyhow, 40 to 60 percent, nine to 10 liters per minute. Um, rebreathe about one third of the exhaled air is useful to preserve carbon dioxide levels and to stimulate breathing. I'll have to look in to see if we can get one of these because I know ours are partial non rebreathers. These are partial rebreathers, so I'll have to look into those. I don't, do I have a picture of those in there? Yeah. 277. Yeah. So those are a little bit bigger than what we have. The ones we have are pretty small, so they're partial non rebreathers. So these partial rebreathers will go down far enough that it pretty much encapsulates the whole face. I do know they carry these in the hospital. What they use them for, I'm not sure. But those might be a good thing for those hyperventilating patients that are having low CO2 that we talked about earlier. Um, trying to get them to breathe in that carbon dioxide to help build that level back up. All right, Venturi mask, we talked about that. Commonly used with COPD patients. Um, these, I think, are, they don't really talk about how much oxygen you can flow with those. So tracheostomy mask is placed over a stoma, provides oxygen. You want to run them about 8 to 10 liters per minute. And again, you don't want to be forcing too much oxygen down there, so you really don't want to be going above that 10 liters per minute when you're dealing with the stoma. <clears throat> so children's and infants are a little bit interesting. Um, you have to use with really smaller ones like infants up to one year old. And even when you get into that uh, toddler stage, you can use a blow by because they won't tolerate a mask over their face. You just put the mask or an open tube up next to their face and let it blow. You don't want to blow it on their face because babies will hold their breath if you put air directly on their face, which is counterproductive when you're trying to get oxygen into them. So you have it blown past them and they're a little more tolerant of, tolerant of it. Um, and as they the passes over their face, they're going to be inhaling that oxygen. So, facial injuries may require frequent suctioning. All right, so we're almost done. Good. Um, airway adjunct, endotracheal tube may be needed. Obstructions, you want to make sure you're suctioning out any obstructions, especially when you get solid objects in there. If you can reach down there with that tube, grab onto it and pull it out, that's great. Um, abdominal thrust, chest thrust, finger sweeps. Again, finger sweeps are, should be a last resort. You don't want to lose a finger in there. Um, dentures, partial dentures. 
Make sure you can remove any device. Also braces. Think about braces when you're putting pressure down on that mouth, what you could be causing damage to. Uh, with infants and children, the tongue does take up more space. Trachea is softer, chest wall is softer. Um, their oxygen burn rate is twice that of an adult. So their metabolism is really high, so they're going to be burning off oxygen really quickly. And we talked about the excess of pressure, making sure you have a properly sized mask for pediatrics. Um, you can use an adult mask on a child, but you can't use it on an infant. You're going to have a hard time getting that over an infant to be able to properly get a seal on it. And then be prepared for gastric and uh, distension. Remember, as that stomach fills up with oxygen, think about the stomach's location to the diaphragm, how it's going to push up against that diaphragm, making it harder to get breaths in. Okay. So we're going to go over this part pretty quick. So basically, in the um, back of the truck, if we ask you guys to help us with ET tubes, basically you're going to help us get it set up. Um, you're going to help us get the patient in the right position, get oxygen ready. You're going to be bagging them while we get our stuff ready. Um, you may be asked to help with a burp maneuver, which is getting air out of the, out of the gastric area. There's also another one called the, I'm going to butcher this one. I believe it's called the Silex maneuver where you put a little bit of pressure on the Adam's apple and it's just slide pressure downward on the Adam's apple to help us bring the vocal cords into view. So if we have an oral airway in the, and we're bagging using an oral airway, what we'll ask you guys to do as we're getting ready to go in is to take out the oral airway. And what I like people to do is not to take it out, but to take it and bend it over the lip. And that way it's still between the teeth and it keeps that mouth open. And then it's also real close to where if I can't get in, get an ET tube, we can slap that thing back into place, continue bagging them with an airway in place. Okay. Okay, they call the burp, that the burp maneuver. I've never heard it called that. It's so, uh, usually, um, I've always heard it called a silex or celiax or something like that, where you just put a little bit of pressure down on the Adam's apple. They're calling it a burp maneuver, where you're taking and pushing that cardi 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 cricoid cartilage downwards. And it's very gentle. You don't have to like push real hard. Usually it's just a very small movement to allow the vocal cords to come into view as we're looking down. Yeah. They're kind of showing you pushing on either side of it. I don't like that because we've got the carotid arteries right next to it. So um, usually I, I'll just take two fingers. If I'm helping someone do it, I'll take two fingers, put it right over it and push downward on it a little bit. Okay, once the tube's in place, um, we're gonna ensure proper placement by two methods. Um, and then we'll secure and anchor the commercial with a commercial restraint, which we'll show you guys later on. And then uh, you may be asked to monitor lung sounds and epigastric sounds. So if we ask you to listen, Think of what you're listening to. So the first place you're going to listen to is the abdomen, right above the um, epigastric area, right below the, the sternal notch. And you're going to be listening for bubbling and air going into the uh, stomach. The next place will be the lungs. Doesn't matter which one you listen to first. Um, if you hear it on the right side, but you don't hear it on the left side, it usually means I've right stemmed the patient. 
and I'm going to have to back the ET tube out a little bit. If you're hearing it on both sides, that's usually a good sign. So. All right. And then once we get it secured, um, ventilate 10 to 12 times per minute, hold the tube against the patient's teeth with two fingers, one hand, blah, blah, blah. Back to doing regular ventilating. One breath every five to six seconds. Now, if we're doing CPR at the same time, we'll be doing continuous CPR. So whoever's bagging will just, every five seconds you'll bag. There'll be no pause in the CPR at that point in time. CPR will just be continued. So you'll have to kind of time your CPR when you see the guy go down with the compression as he's lifting up, you squeeze. Now, if you start feeling resistance, let, it, let somebody know. Patience is defibrillated. Um, you can remove the bag. A lot of times we'll just set the bag on the patient's chest, clear it, go right back to it. Watch for changes in patient's mental status. If he starts coming alive and alert and talking to you, or opens his eyes or something like that, let somebody know. You're gonna be the one that's gonna be able to see that. Because everybody else is gonna be working down around the chest area, the arms, giving medications or whatever. Uh, we don't put medications down the BVM anymore. Um, we have way too many ways of getting either IO access or intravenous access that we don't put medications down the tube anymore. Yeah. All right, any questions? Okay. In the book, there's like things like the EMP oxygen or ventilation. You just have like, it kind of talks about it, but like your golden rules for when you use one or the other. Like in your experience, um, yeah, so ask that again. So, like, what it does in the book on page 279 is like talks about oxygen or ventilation, and then it gives you like four scenarios. And I'm just curious, obviously, you talked about I feel comfortable about when to use ventilation, I think, but like mm -hmm. when to use oxygen and not ventilation, okay. So obviously, like, if they're in respiratory distress, you know. Yeah, let me see if those are in this thing here. We probably covered it. I just don't Okay. So um, ventilation, like I said, if they're breathing less than 10 times a minute, you're going to start ventilating them. Um, that's just a rule. Um, if they're breathing 10 minutes, 10 to... 12 times a minute, then you want to be prepared to ventilate, but you could probably just give them oxygen and see if that helps bring them up and starts their breathing back into a normal rate. Um, mine is based on their mentation. Are they able to protect their airway? And are they breathing adequately? So if their mentation's altered or um, there's something that's just not right about the way they're acting. They're unable, you know, their respirations are slow, too high, but they got that altered mental status. I'm going to start with oxygen, but then I'm going to, I'm going to be considering ventilating them at that point in time. Um, again, it depends on, it really depends on how your patient's doing and, you're going to, so we always say treat the patient, not the monitor. <laughs> the monitor may say they're screwed up, but they're acting all right. I'm not going to discount the monitor, but I'm going to treat what I'm seeing. Because it could be that, yeah, they got a blood pressure of, um, say I got them hooked up to a four lead. They've got a blood pressure of, 
70 or 60 over 50 and their heart rate's going at 180 beats a minute, but they're alert oriented and talking to me. I'm going to question the monitor and I'm going to treat the patient. I'm going to redo the blood pressure. I might have my driver stop so I can get a clear, clear reading on the monitor on the four lead. Because <coughs> some of that stuff picks up noise and external stuff from the, the truck. And so just you treat your patient first and then you take into consideration what the monitor is telling you. The only time we don't do that is in when we're running 12 lead and it's shown a STEMI. And it doesn't matter what the patient's presenting like, I'm going to consider it a STEMI until proven otherwise. Because then they can be alert and oriented talking to you and be right in the middle of a heart attack. It's ST elevation, myocardial infarction. So basically it's a heart attack. They're not in cardiac arrest yet, but if it continues, they will be. Uh, get them to the hospital. Yep, because you can't reverse it in the field. They need to actually be in a what they call a cardiac cardiac cath lab, where they go in and they'll put a stent in the heart and open that vessel up. And just because you don't see a STEMI doesn't mean they're necessarily having a heart attack because there's also non-STEMI myocardial infarctions. And so we'll get into that a little bit down the road when we get into cardiac, but uh, yeah. Um, usually you do a 12 lead EKG on them and it shows up on the EKG. Yep. Any other questions? You guys doing okay out there? Are you still able to hear me? Yeah, I can camera? hear you. Okay, good. I need to start carrying my phone with me so I can see when you guys text me. All right. <laughs> so it's nine o'clock now. Um, we're not going to be able to get through another thing in the next 30 minutes. So um, we'll test the first hour on Monday, go through scene size up and primary assessment, and then get into vital signs on Wednesday, hopefully. And then after that, um, I'll get a schedule for the ER and the hospital up here and you guys can start signing up for ride time and get your stuff in for that. All right, if there are no other questions, we'll let you guys know. Next Saturday class is gonna be, I think it's not until April. Yeah, so our next Saturday class will be April 29th for extrication. That's what we just covered today and Monday. So the respiratory stuff. That's eight o'clock till 